The following sermon is by Manny Alanese, pastor at St. Stephen's Chapel in Northwest San Antonio, Texas. For more information, for prayer, or to support us financially, please visit our website at ststephenschapel.org or call us at 210-241-5969. In the resurrection, everyone who inherits the kingdom of God will bear the image of the man from heaven, Jesus Christ our Lord. With that, let us prepare our hearts to hear God's truth through the preaching of the word, which begins with prayer. Let us pray together. O oh Lord, you have given us your word for a light to shine upon our path. Grant us so to meditate on that word and to follow its teaching that we may find in it the light that shines more and more until the perfect day of your return through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. See that moon in yonder sky? Tis only half that meets the eye. See that moon in yonder sky? Tis only half that meets the eye. Now that's a that's a line from a poem from a hymn actually that was written back in the 1700s by a German uh, a, a German poet Matthias Claudius. Matthias Claudius wrote a uh, of a hymn that has that line. And basically what he what it means or what he's saying is when you see that the moon, even if it's full, you're only seeing half of it. You're not seeing the other half. You're not seeing the other side. And see, that is the way it is for us. For us. Even in our lives today, as we live uh, our lives today, as we live our lives in this age of decay and death, going through and enduring the ups and downs of a fractured world that we're living in, in a body, a physical body that must persevere the struggles and the, and the traumas of financial troubles that continue to increase, just check the price of gas, of personal problems and personal relationships that seem to be struggling all the time, even with our loved ones, of, of illnesses and, and diseases that sap the life out of our bodies, of violence in our streets and in our schools by extremists on both sides of the political aisles, if you will, our culture is in battle. And by the wars that we have to endure, even the war over there in the Ukraine that's going on now, there were many people who were dying and suffering today. You see, death. Death, because of the resurrection of Christ, no longer has power over us. Okay? So when we look at our lives on this side of yonder moon, there's another side to us, and the resurrection side. There's another part that's beyond the curtain of this side of glory, and that is the resurrection. We're still in chapter 15 of the resurrection where Paul is talking to the Corinthians about the, the resurrection. Now, he's going into more detail about this. He's going to get into detail about being on, what it's like being on the other side of the curtain, so to speak, which is interesting. Like, like, why should you care? But why, sh why should it matter? Like, it's so far off. It's, it doesn't seem practical to even talk about. But Paul's getting into that conversation. He's, he's, he's getting into the and talking about some questions that are 
like beyond our grasp to really kind of even understand, but he's going to address it when there's a reason why he does it. He says that, that God will raise us from the dead in a new and restored body, in a body that will be fit, a body that will be that we fit for a new reality. See, that's the promise of the gospel. And that's why Paul is starting to go into it. He's saying that our, our current reality in our current physical body, in the body that we live in, and in, in, in the body that we're in, and who we are right now, is going to have to be transformed to be fit for the kingdom of God, for the kingdom of God. And that's why it matters. This is a, a God promise. This is, it's the message of the gospel, if you will that the apostle is conveying to the Corinthian church and to us today that in the resurrection, there must be a transformation that takes place. And that's why we get into in the resurrection, everyone who inherits the kingdom of God must bear the image of the man from heaven, the man from heaven. So the critical issue that Paul is having to deal with, the critical issue that Paul is addressing is explaining how the dead are raised. How the dead are raised. That's a, that's a very practical question. It's a good question to ask. If, you're, if you've ever shared the gospel with someone and they start asking you questions about that, and you're talking about the resurrection and stuff. And so there, that's a very practical question. Well, how does that work? How, do, how does it work? How, how are the dead raised? And, and, and so you get into that. That's the critical issue that the Corinthians are dealing with. And Paul is dealing with the Corinthians. That's the critical issue that, 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 that he's dealing with us today. Now, when we look at our passage, when we look at our text, we see that our text can be broken down into two parts. The first part is, the better question is, how is the resurrection possible? How is it possible? And, and which, which Paul covers in verses 35 to 41. And the second part of our text deals with what is the nature, what nature, what is the nature of our resurrected body? What is the nature of our resurrected body? So we start off with the first question, the first point that Paul is trying to make, or Paul makes. How is the resurrection possible? Again, is that a fair question? Do you even care? you care? In just a second, we're going we're gonna to tell you why you care about this. But do you even care? Why is, a, why is a resurrection possible? I mean, when we think about something so incredible, so incredible, it's beyond our belief almost. It's beyond, we're taking it on faith that there's another side here. There's another side. There's the other side of the curtain. That what's going to happen to us is certainly going to be supernatural. And then it's certainly going to be an act of God. It's going to be an action of God. And the reason that Paul is addressing this is because there's misconceptions going on in the church of Corinth. Okay? There's, there's, there's misunderstanding about resurrection in, in that Greek culture. And, and it goes on even today. And so Paul gets into uh, explaining, okay, here's what I mean. Here's what's going on. And, and so what he's dealing with is he's dealing with the Greek culture. He's dealing with Greek philosophers. And he's explaining that there's going to have to be a transformation when, when it comes to the resurrection and how the dead are raised. Now, to understand that, we have to understand the mentality that we're dealing with. What is the mentality that we're dealing with? And, and what is what what is Paul have the what's the hurdle that Paul's having to overcome? It, not just for the Corinthians, but for us too. Now, traditionally, in Greek philosophy, they they understood a human being to be a, a made composed of a, a soul or a spirit, if you want to call it. Uh, and, and they would look at it as a divine. 
divine soul or spirit. And they thought that it was imprisoned in a physical body. Now note the word imprisoned because that's what they felt. That God, that whoever did this would get a divine spirit, grab it, that's already alive apparently, and put it in, imprison it in a physical body. So what does that make a physical body for them, for that type of mentality? It, it makes it awful. It makes it horrible that we're in prison in this physical body. And it's a prison because we get sick and, and we, we terrible things can happen to us. And we suffer and we have to endure stuff. So they're in, you're in prison in this physical body. So they believe that at death, at the point of death, the soul or the spirit would escape from the imprisonment of the physical body and return to the divine fire. This is them thinking. Return to the divine fire from where it came. And what is the divine fire? Well, the divine fire is the stars, the, the, the stars of the heaven. They return, you return back there. That's the mentality, okay? That's the mentality that Paul's having to overcome. And, and when he's overcoming this, and when he's explaining this, it, 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 it's, there's people today that, that believe that. There's people today that, that believe that, that our spirits have been alive forever, or certainly for a long time. And then when we're born, God just grabs a spirit, throws it in that baby, physical baby, and, and the baby's born. And, and so you have all these misconceptions, and Paul's going to get it. He's going to tell us this is the way, this is the reality of the situation. And, and certainly, it, it, it is a tough task for that generation and even for ours, but especially for that generation, especially for the Corinthians. Now, think about something. Do you remember when the, the Apostle Paul addresses the audience there at, on Mars Hill? Okay, you remember when he addresses the, the audience at Mars Hill? They wanted to hear different philosophers talk, including a philosopher like Paul, who has a new idea about something. So they were very friendly with Paul when he was speaking about the gospel. They were very polite. And then when he started mentioning the resurrection of the body of Christ, they stopped him. They didn't want to hear any more. It was over. They didn't want to hear it. They thought it was filthy. The body's bad. The body's filthy. The body's terrible. You know, it's a prison. And, and so this is the mindset that Paul is dealing with. That's why in verse 36, he says, you fool, you fools. He says, you foolish persons. What you Soul, soul, does not come into life unless it what? Unless it dies. What you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, a, a seed, perhaps of wheat or some type of seed. Is what he's, that's the example he's giving that's going to that's gonna generate, basically. Now, when Paul starts talking to them, uh, and to us, perhaps, he's being extremely harsh with them. Uh, he's rebuking them. And it's not a mild rebuke. It's a strong rebuke against them. Eve, in, in, their, in, their, in what they believe as far as what happens to the soul, what happens to the body after they die, so he's rebuking what they believe because, because of what? what? What are they not taking into account? Now, these are also Corinthians, uh, Christian Corinthians, okay, who call themselves Christian. What are they not taking uh, to account when they're looking at all this? They're not taking God into account. They're forgetting about God. They're forgetting about who it's all about. And for that reason, they're fools. They're being foolish. What is sown is a dead body, a dead body that goes back to dust, a dead body that is put, in, put into the earth, so to speak. And, and that's how we're buried. 
The dead body is basically a seed. Now, there's a reason why he's using these words. From the seed comes a, a what? A new life. A new body. Yes, a new body. A new body at the resurrection, okay? At the resurrection, when Jesus comes, we're going to get a new body. But, but that new body is tied to the former body, the old body. See, what we have to realize is there's a continuity between who we are now and who we will be in the kingdom, in, our, in the resurrection, in our future new imperishable body. There's a continuity. Now, we don't know exactly how that's going to work out because it's going to be sinless. You know, you start thinking about that. You start thinking, okay, all right, if, if, man is, if I'm like this here, boy, and over there is a continuity. I'm still going to be Manny, and you're still going to be you. But we're going to be sinless. I'm thinking, man, that's going to take 99% of Manny. Like, what's going to be left? But no, there's going to be a connect. There's going to be a connect. A connection. In the new resurrected body, we, you, will be transformed. It will be a new reality. We're going to be set in a new reality. It's, it is going to be different, okay? But one of the things when I was studying this passage, we did, we studied and went in our Zoom Bible study on Tuesday. We studied how uh, the, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, one time they came to Jesus, right? And they said, you know, this, this man marries this, 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 this lady, and he dies. He's got seven brothers, and he dies. She becomes a widow, and, and their custom it was customary for them to, for the brother to take the widow so she could have children and she could be taken care of. Well, they, you know, they, they pushed that even further down. Well, I see he had seven brothers and each of them took his turn. Each of them died. Each of them died. And she took the next brother. She took the next brother. You know, they go, okay, okay, bye, okay, now answer this question. Because it was customary for them to do that here to take the widow. Has everybody stay with me here so far? Okay. Now they're asking Jesus in the kingdom, in heaven. Well, whose who's wife is she going to be? She's got seven husbands. And Jesus blows their mind, and he blows our mind. And, and he does it because he, he says something very interesting that really kind of makes some Christians sad because they think that, because Jesus says it's not going to be that way. There will not be the giving, you know, of marriage into marriage and all that. He goes like that. He starts talking about things like that. There's not going to be that way. Well, what, what some Christians took that to mean, they misunderstood Jesus saying that we won't be recognized as husband and wife. They took that to mean that we're not going to be married. There's no marriage. We no longer, you know, he, what, what they, in the, in the, and what happened there is that, and what Jesus is saying is that in the resurrection, in the kingdom of God, Everything's going to be different. What they are assuming is that everything's going to remain the same. In other words, marriage and the, you know, the widow and one husband and one other husband, all that, that it's just going to be continuing on in the kingdom of God in heaven. And, and Jesus is saying, it ain't going to be like that. It's going to be totally different. It's a new reality. That's what Jesus, that's the point Jesus was making. And some Christians took that to believe, well, you're not going to be married again. You won't know your wife and all that's not what he's saying. What Jesus is saying and what Paul saying today is that it's going to be different. It's going to be a new reality, a perfect reality in the kingdom of God. And that's why he goes through this pain of talking about what, what, how this all comes about. And then, so as we look at verses 39 through 41, Paul expands on, on, on his argument of what's going on. And so he, he includes a, a different physicality uh, when, when, it, when he's talking about creation in the creation narrative. In fact, he goes back to Genesis and starts quoting some stuff in Genesis in the creation narrative, but he goes in reverse order uh, about how everything's going to be created different. And, and, uh, and he talks about how the, 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 well, he goes backwards from the stars to the plants to, you know, humans and all that. So he, so he talks, he goes back to the creation narrative. And each of them is going to have their own physicality. It's going to be different. 
as far as different, meaning uh, a, a horse is going to be different from a human. An animal is going to be different from a human, and a star is going to be different from a, an animal, and it's, they're all going to be different in, in their physical creation, a new creation, a new body. The Lord God will grant distinct splendor, glory, radiance in the different physical bodies in the heavenly realms. They're going to be glorious. All of them. All the different, all the different physical reality. It, it, you're, are you getting a picture that it's going to be a, a physical world but different? And in, in, it's going to be an imperishable world, physical world, but different than it is here. And that's what he—that's the message he's trying to convey in the heavenly realm. So that brings us back. That brings us to the next question he starts having to deal with. He deals with the nature. What is the nature of the resurrected body? In other words, what what are the characteristics of the resurrected body? What what are the characteristics of the resurrected body? Now that's the second question that he's having to address. What kind of body? Are we going to see up there? What kind of body are we going to have? What is the nature? Now, he addresses that in verses 42 through 49. The apostle takes a look at our present body today, and he compares it with our transformed body in the resurrection. In the resurrection. Okay, now, so now we'll gather our focus back as a little angel came to visit us. <laughs> Notice I said angel. She's not an angel. She'll be, she won't be an angel when she's in the resurrection. She's going to be a person. Okay. So, okay. So, so now Paul takes on, when he's talking about the characteristics for what the, what kind of nature are we going to have? So he talks about, and he makes a comparison between the present body, the body you and I have today, with the future transformed body that we're going to have. Two different things he's going to make, but he's making a comparison between the two. And he, and he talks out, he lays out four clauses that he repeats. These are four verbal clauses that he repeats. He says, it will be sown or it will be raised. And those are the verbs, that the clauses that he uses. Paul describes the resurrection of the dead, okay, the resurrection of the dead. He said he regards the physical body, the physical body will be sown as perishable. Okay, remember he says physical. And I think that what, the reason I'm stressing physical is because sometimes we get, and people that we know get a misconception that we're going to be spirits out up there in heaven, harping and playing on a harp, you know, on a cloud somewhere. No, this is the picture that Paul is painting for us that's going to be reality. And he's saying, He's saying, in regards to the physical body, what is sown is perishable, meaning a, per a perishable physical body. It will be sown perishable. It would be, it's going to be raised, what? Imperishable. It is going to be sown in dishonor. Think about that one just for a second. You are going to be sown, die in dishonor. Is that true? Yeah, it's true. Why? Because we're sinners. We're going to be sown in dishonor and raised in what? Glory. Raised in glory. We will be sown in weakness. And now we can all say an amen to that. But we're going to be raised in power. We're going to be sown a natural body and raised a spiritual body. A spiritual, physical body. So now he's making the comparisons here. And again, the principle that on all this, and the point he's making is that there's going to be a tremendous transformation. A transformation uh, that, that, that we must notice is a, con a continuity, it's a continuation of who we are today, your identity today, who you're going to be in the resurrection. Okay? It is not like you're going to not know anything about this former life. How that's going to work out, not clear, not clear. 
other than it's going to be sinless. So we can rejoice at that. Now, what does that mean, it's going to be sinless? Okay, well, meaning that we're not going to question anything about God, that everything he does is perfect. Golly, everything's perfect. Everything he says, everything he's done, everyone who's there, whether we believe that, man, I can't believe you're here. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. I just didn't think you were going to make it. You know, it's not, no, we're going to be like, yes, yes. And everyone who's not there, no questions, no questions asked. There won't be any tears because he's perfect. He's, see, we can't comprehend that. We can't comprehend how God does this. No, we can't because we're not God. He is. And we'll be rejoicing at everything he does. Thus it stands written. It stands written that the first Adam became a living being. Okay? The first Adam became a living being. Remember, where was the first Adam from? Dust. Dirt. Dust. 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 From dust became a living being because because God breathed life into him, right? Okay, so from, from uh, the first Adam, the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Now, why does Paul make that statement again? Why is he making that statement? Well, he has to counter the, 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 the Greek philosophy that these people believed in, what they were taught in schools or whatever else. That, that, that the spirit, that, that God just didn't pick up a spirit and put it in a body. He had to counter all that, okay? He had to counter that, that uh, the, the human experience, if you will. So, so Paul is making a, 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 an, an interesting statement because he makes the statement about Adam, now, he starts, now he's talking about Adam, and now he's going to contrast Adam with Christ and this state of being, this being released from this from physical death. Paul uses Adam and Christ as an analogy to clarify the confusion, okay? Even the confusion that we're having right now. He's comparing Adam and Christ. He's using an, Adam and Christ as an analogy. He touches on to, to clear this up, he touches on Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. This is what it says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. It says, The Lord formed the man of the uh, the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Dust, God formed you into a, a man or a woman, well, a man. That's how it started. Then he breathed into him, and he became a living creature. And so that's important. Okay? It's not like it's not important. Of course it's important. This shows that it is not the spiritual who came first. It was the natural man who came first. The first man was from the earth, man of dust. The second man, would be Christ as a man from heaven. That man from heaven came to save us from, from us dying eternally. In verse 49, the Apostle Paul brings it home. He says, for, he brings it home for us, true believers, to, for, for Christians. Today, we bear the image of the man of dust, the man from dust. In the resurrection, of the body, we shall be transformed to the image of the man from heaven. There will be a transformation, and we'll be the will be the image of Christ in heaven in the kingdom. Okay, so we go back to the question: So what? What does it matter? Why do you care? Why should you even care? Why should you even care about all this? Why should you even try to make sense of all this? Why should you even go back and reread this while you're at home? To dig even deeper and allow the Spirit to work on you. Why should you care? 
Well, because flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's why you should care. In the state of being that we're in, even as a true believer, we cannot inherit the kingdom of God. There has to be a transformation. Why? Because at the way we are right now, in the way we are right now, we cannot stand in the holy presence of God. There must be a transformation. That's why you care about this. That's why this matters. That's why what Paul says resonates. Everything changes. That in the life that you're living today, the God's word acknowledges that you're struggling. That it's a labor. It, you know, it is a labor to live your life as a Christian today. To walk with Christ today is a labor. Why is it a labor? Because there are struggles that you go through that test your faith. Because this is a fractured world. This is a broken world. And as you labor to get through it and continue to believe, and you and you get this image of your resurrected body where you don't have to struggle with uh, a trick knee or a, a hurting shoulder or, or the pain that you feel from some other type of suffering and even death, that things are going to be transformed, that you are going to be transformed because flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God. That is a transformation. It, 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 is, it, it is the, God is going to bring back into reality. He's going to restore the way he created the world, the way he created humanity. To be imperishable, to be in, to be in his holy presence. And that's why we rejoice in him. We rejoice in him. So what you and me, what we, what the world must know is that this transformation, for this transformation to take place, that transformation has to start on this side of heaven. How? By believing the gospel that you're hearing, that you've heard. By believing. And, and, and well, it starts by you. It started for all of you by answering the call. The call to, to come to Christ. To, to come to him and believe in him, and to trust in him. And there you responded to God's call, to his supernatural call. He opened our hearts and minds to believe that that call was real, and it came from the king. I know a guy that lived a life of, of a sinner, and but he thought he had it all under control. And, and he lived a, a life where uh, by the way, he's a, he was a police officer, and he worked. He worked on the bad guys, the the guys that were horrible, the ones the ones that committed the worst crimes you could imagine. And, and he, so he thought he was okay. In terms of his future, even in heaven. And, and he would he would believe he believed there was a God, there was something real, and he also worshipped. All the time. He would go with his friends, other cops, and worship at the local bar where they would confess their sins to each other and celebrate how they were beating the bad guy and how they were winning at life. Totally deceived about what the truth reality was. You know what happened to him? He ran into a king. He ran into a king of glory who exposed his life to him and changed everything. Because that person answered the call. He answered the call of this king. See, that king is the one who called you. The king is the one who's calling your loved ones to respond to this call of truth. So I'm asking you, and I know all of you, that have you answered that call? Have you answered a call? And, and the answer is yes, you have. Now, some of your loved ones are still thinking about it. So the other next question is, are you continuing to answer that call? 
Are you continuing to labor in your life in Christ? Because there, there's a kingdom that awaits. There's a new body. There's a transformation that's coming. But that transformation starts on this side of heaven, and it requires us to answer that glorious and wonderful call that, that you have heard. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we do thank You've been listening to Manny Alanese, pastor at St. Stephen's Chapel. For more information about our church, visit our website at ststephenschapel.org or call us at 210-241-5969. Please join us prayerfully and financially as we seek to glorify God by preaching His Word and spreading the gospel of grace in boldness and selflessness.